Good evening. I hereby call this November 9th meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. As always, before we get started, we'd like to give honor to the brave men and women of our police department, our fire department, and our emergency management department. We thank you for your service. Appreciate everything that you do on a daily basis to make sure that the citizens in our city are safe. Uh, for those that are not as familiar with the process, there is a general agenda and there is a consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are approved with one sweeping motion unless a member of this council or committee acts an item to be pulled for consideration. With that being said, members of the committee or council, are there any items that should be pulled for consideration on consent? If not, I'd entertain a motion. We've approved motion the approved balance. <laughs> Uh, we have a motion to approve in a second. Uh, we will do the roll call. Uh, Councilmember Larson? Yes. Councilwoman? Parman? Aye. And Councilman McIntosh? Aye. That's an aye for me. So that is unanimous. The consent agenda is approved unanimously. Uh, we'll call item G1, please. Item G1, presentation by Winston-Salem Police Department Gang Unit and Community Steering Committee. Council, I ask this item to be added to the agenda. Frankly, there are many people in our city who aren't aware that we have a, a gang unit or a community steering committee. So I wanted them to hear exactly what we're doing every single day to work on solving gang violence in our community and working with gangs in our community. Uh, with that being said, I'll kick it to Ms. Tasha Logan Ford or Chief Thompson or Miles uh, to cue this item up. Chair Taylor, good evening. Tasha Logan Ford, Assistant City Manager, Mayor Pro Tim Adams, members of the committee, council, and council elect. The item before you is usually presented on an annual basis, activities regarding the gang steering committee and our community committee. We had a little delay this year dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So Sergeant Wally is on the call this evening and he will present this item. In addition to providing the annual statistics that we typically provide in March of each year, we do have some updated information that will take us to the current time frame that we're in. I think our, our numbers that we have will take us actually through October. So with that, Sergeant Wally, if you would present this item for the committee. Thank and you. Sergeant Wally, thanks for making yourself available for the presentation. You have the floor, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I appreciate it. And uh, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, Council Member Taylor, thank you for having me. Um, and Ms. Logan Ford, uh, I'm a little bit unfamiliar with how this is going to work. Uh, do I just need to say next slide or click anything? That's correct. Meredith will advance your slides for you. Okay. All right. Well, as uh, Ms. Logan Ford said, my name is Sergeant Tyler Wally. Uh, I'm the supervisor of the Winston-Salem Police Department's gang unit. And uh, this is the Public Safety Committee update uh, for November of 2020. As she mentioned, usually we give this in March of each year, but due to the circumstances around the pandemic, we did have to delay it a little bit. Um, just a little bit about the gang unit uh, in an update, uh, just a quick refresher of what I, I dealt with and, and told y'all about last year. We were formed in 2006. Uh, we have one sergeant, two corporals, and seven officers as allocated manpower. We do have an FBI uh, task force officer that is assigned to us, that's Officer Montgomery. Uh, he works out of the Greensboro field office for the FBI, and he takes on lots of larger scale cases. Uh, we do have a Homeland Security Investigations Task Force officer, that's uh, Corporal Jamerson, and she works closely with Homeland Security. And we also have a gang graffiti coordinator, that's Officer Bracken, and he's the person that we route all of our copies of any gang graffiti incidents to, and he is the one that deals with graffiti cameras and follows up on all the graffiti that uh, cases that come into our office. Um, some of the accolades that the gang unit has received over the years, uh, there's, there's more than this, but these are the, the larger ones. We were awarded the NCGI Gang Unit of the Year for 2011 and 2016. And this past year, we received the Special Achievement Award for the North Carolina Gang Investigators Association. And you can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, what we do in a nutshell, uh, it's, it's a lot of different things. Um, we're kind of a hybrid unit, I would call us, because if you have typical detectives that work in our criminal investigations division, they handle follow-up cases, you know, the higher profile adopted cases like robberies, rapes, house break-ins, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we do accept cases for follow-up, but we also are an intelligence unit and we're a suppression unit. So we uh, 
typically wear plain clothes, have unmarked cars, and we will go out there and and enforce the laws that we see being violated. We will follow up on our own cases, and we will um, deal with gang members actually in their own environments, not just adopting cases and trying to you know follow up on things from behind the desk. We will get out there and and talk with them, and and we try to get to know them better than they know themselves. That's one of the things that I've always said throughout the years. We're an effective intelligence unit when we know them a lot better than anybody else does. Um, and so when we get to know them, we do the process of validation. There'll be a slide a little bit later that talks about what criteria there are to validate a gang member. Um, and also, like I said, we have follow-up investigations. We dump all the intelligence that we do gain into a database uh, that's called GangNet, and it's only available for other law enforcement agencies. And it's it's just a one-stop shop for all of their their information, where they work, their tattoos, uh, you know, who who their their girlfriend or boyfriend is, uh, just every case they've ever been involved in. It's just a mountain of intelligence dumped into GangNet. Um, there will be another slide later in the presentation about the spray paint sales operation that I'll go into in more in depth. Um, and we do community presentations, department level training. We do our own in-house training as well as for other agencies. So we'll travel all over the state and uh, do training for other agencies as well as for hospitals or for social services, uh, juvenile justice. We've given several presentations to them and to probation. Uh, and on top of all that, we do assist federal agencies uh, as mentioned in the previous slide with our task force officers. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, the gang steering committee is uh, something that's uh, near and dear to how effective the gang unit can be. Um, we, um, there are three ways actually you can uh, uh, get to a, the root of a gang problem. There's suppression, prevention, and intervention. Primarily the gang unit is tasked with suppression. And that's us going out there, uh, pulling over a gang member, following up on cases, whatever that may be, uh, you know, trying to suppress the crime that they're, they're committing. Um, more to the root of intervention and prevention is the gang steering committee. And that's the Winston-Salem for South County gang steering committee that uh, is um, integral in this, uh, this ability to prevent uh, interrupt gang activity and try and keep kids from actually getting involved in the gangs. And if they do get involved in the gangs, they are also key to getting them out of that gang lifestyle. Um, you know, while we're following up on a robbery or assisting uh, CID with, with homicides and, and, and other high profile cases, we're very thankful to have the gang steering committee that's made up of several members of the communities, stakeholders, uh, community activists that actually take a, an interest in trying to prevent gang activity in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County. And you can go to the next slide. And uh, the committee consists of three action teams, uh, as I mentioned before, intervention and prevention. Law enforcement, of course, is us and clergy. Um, we have Pastor uh, Jason Sloan and Pastor Curtis Friday that are the steering head committee, uh, uh, the heads of the steering committee, and they do an excellent job of getting the word out and they follow up on referrals that we give to them. That's the juvenile referral form. So if we do see an at-risk juvenile um, who we think in our professional opinion is gonna be a gang member or is at risk of becoming a gang member, we will refer that juvenile to the gang steering committee and they will take a hands-on approach. They'll, they'll go to their school, they'll go to their home, they'll go to uh, have meetings with their parents, they'll refer them to parenting classes, they'll give them resources, they'll even uh, give them um, the ability to go either get a job or go to uh, summer camps, uh, just because we all know the the devils play things. I, I don't I'll answer the devil things. So um, I'll above it, won't refer these juveniles to them. You can go next slide. And I won't read off all of these names, but I'll give you just a, a you know a few seconds to take a look. We do have a lot of people that are involved in the gang steering committee. Uh, as mentioned before, there's Pastor Curtis Friday and co-chair uh, Pastor Jason Sloan. Um, Dr. Pam Peoples Joyner is the person that works at the Winston-Salem Police Department as our uh, community uh, liaison, and she has been excellent for uh, the gang unit with the Winston-Salem Police Department, and she's been excellent for the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office as well, uh, working closely with them. 
Um, so she's really my go-to person. Um, if I ever have a need or I have a question about what's going on with the gang steering committee, she is the person that I go to first and foremost, and she does an excellent job. So we appreciate her very much. Sergeant Wiley, if I may interrupt, thank you to Dr. People's Joiner and to all the members of the gang steering committee. We can't call your names individually, but we did want to just pause for the calls and thank you for your service. Well said, thank you. And you can go to the next slide. Okay, and again, just as a, a bit of a refresher, um, what is a gang? You can see that there is the North Carolina General Statute definition right there, but what it basically breaks down to is that it's just gotta be three or more people that are committing a violent uh, misdemeanor or a felony, and they have a common name, sign, symbol, or color. And, and while that may seem pretty simplistic, um, to make a group of people a gang, we, we do actually do a lot of our homework and we make sure that we're not just making a group of kids that are in middle school or high school that are getting involved in some fights here and there that like to call themselves something. They, they have to establish a pattern. Um, we're not gonna give a whole lot of weight to some group of kids that are acting out um, because we'd have you know hundreds of gangs if, if we wanted to actually make all these different groups of kids gangs. Uh, so we do have probably upwards of about 30 to 35 gangs active in Winston-Salem at this time. And a lot of them are going to be the ones obviously that meet this definition right here, but the ones that are our neighborhood hybrid non-traditional gangs that may only have five or six members. We do our homework. We do make them a gang once they started getting involved in, uh, you know, felonies, but normally the, they'll start out breaking into houses or they get involved in any kind of shooting incident. That's going to be, uh, you know, your, your violent felonies. Once they start establishing that pattern, that's when in our eyes, they truly meet the definition of what a gang is. And as I mentioned uh, a couple slides before, the validation process, you can see what the criteria are that we use to validate somebody in a gang. Um, they can self-admit, we can have a reliable source, and that could be anybody like a parent, a, a pastor, uh, a teacher that tells us that they've seen the signs and they've heard this person admitting that they're uh, involved in gangs. Um, <clears throat> gang symbols, hand signs, or graffiti. That's decently self-explanatory. If you've got them drawing on all of their notebooks in school and they're they're putting five-pointed stars for blood, six-pointed stars for crips, um, you know it, it's not just as simple as having a star. We are going to ask them the the clarifying questions of why are you drawing this in there, why you had these numbers in this uh, in this color, um, and that they also can wear their colors when they're going to school or when they're out on the street. When it says display of color, style of dress. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, normally, we're talking about all predominantly one color. It's going to be monochromatic. Whatever gang they're associating with, they're going to use one color to denote which gang they're in. And oftentimes, it's going to be in the form of uh, either a, a pro football or basketball jersey with a certain number on it, or it's going to be a bandana, red, blue, black, whatever gang they're associating with that's the number one reason or number one way they're going to show gang affiliation is with one of those Paisley style bandanas neatly pressed and, and hanging out of their pocket. Um, you've got involvement in gang activity, physical evidence of gang memberships, tattoos, of course. Uh, they've actually been getting away from a lot of tattoos because it makes it too easy for us to recognize what gang they're in if they've got you know, uh, Sir 13 or MS 13 or Bloods tattooed on their arms. That one's pretty obvious. And so they've been going away from that one for quite a while now. Uh, they have certain codes that they use. And if they are using those and we can see that they clearly know what they're talking about, then that's going to be gang language or terminology. And of course, social media is the big one right there. They, they love to talk about it on any kind of social media. You can go to the next slide. Uh, the gang stats, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit outdated right now since we're almost at the very end of 2020, but you can see that in total part one crimes for 2018 uh, compared to 2019, there was just a slight rise of 3.96%. And your part one crimes, of course, are going to be your aggravated assaults, homicides, rape, robbery, um, the more serious crimes of that nature. Uh, so just a slight uptick in those numbers right there. In the next slide. And part two crime, that's most of everything else, you know, nothing quite as serious as part one crimes. You can, I won't read them all off for you, but you can see what we're looking at here. And that as well is pretty much 
leveled off across the board compared 2018 to 2019, just a, a slight, barely noticeable rise of 0.21%. And the gang statistics for 2019, you can see that um, we do have a lot of subjects of interest. We do have a lot of people that we monitor. Uh, we only have 614 gang members that are actually been through that validation process. They do have the alert placed on their name. Um, and a lot of people ask why we even bother to, to validate somebody as a gang member. Well, it's, there's several reasons, but the most important reasons are uh, to for officer safety. If we pull over somebody or we're dealing with somebody and we notice that they have a validated gang member alert on their name, we pull it up in our system, that lets the officer know they probably need to take a little bit more time with this person or be a little bit more cautious around them. Um, but like I said, we do have a lot of people that we monitor. We call those gang unit subjects of interest. Uh, so we have even more people that we monitor that are actually SOIs than actual validated gang members. Um, those are your people that are either preparing to be a gang member, uh, we suspect as being a gang member already, or they're a former gang members. They've just not, uh, they've been purged from the system. We haven't dealt with them in probably more than five years. And so by the, um, the, the rules that we operate under for intelligence, we remove that alert from them after five years if they are not still involved in gang activity that's documented through our agency or any other agency. Uh, in 2019, you can see that we seized over $284,000 in property. That's going to be drugs, guns, vehicles, uh, U.S. currency. And I do have some statistics a little bit later that will compare to where we are at this point in 2020. Go to the next slide. Uh, we handled 400 calls for service in 2019, and 179 of those, we wrote a report about them. Uh, we made 499 arrests, including 104 felonies, 378 misdemeanors, and 17 traffic infractions, and we provided 34 community presentations in 2019. And uh, this is actually, uh, these, are, these are great numbers, but, um, you know, we did have uh, a couple people get promoted off of the gang unit in 2019, so we didn't have, uh, I guess, full staff up to 10 people, but you'll see in just a, a minute here, even going into 2020, we're we're blowing those numbers out of the water uh, so far, and we still got two months to go. You go to the next slide. Okay, so far in 2020, the gang unit, as compared to 2019, we still have two months to go. As I mentioned, we made 664 arrests, and you can read what the breakdown is of that. We've already seized over $212,000 in property. Um, we our big uh, focus for 2020 has been guns. Uh, I don't think it's a secret to anybody that there there seems to be uh, an, a rise in gun violence, drive-by shootings, uh, aggravated assaults involving firearms. And so with the addition of the gun crime reduction unit and with uh, the violent firearms uh, investigations team, VFIT and CID, uh, our focus for 2020 really was to see where we could find these guns, see where if we could uh, just make a dent in getting some of these guns out of these kids' hands. And so far in 2020, we have seen 49 guns. And you can go to the next slide. Now, this, uh, this is a map of the location of our gang members. You can see the hotbeds there are going to be on the east side and the south side predominantly. But this map changes all the time. Uh, you can see that they're pretty well spread out all over the county, um, but this this map changes daily. Uh, these guys are very uh, transient. They do not set up shop in one location uh, very often, very long, uh, because they wear out their welcome pretty fast. So once they go into a neighborhood or they go into an apartment complex or whatever it may be, they, they probably make a pretty bad name for themselves right away and Therefore, they're, they're out in a month. They're out in a few months. So while it, it does show the hotbed of activity on the east side and the south side, it's changing all the time. Uh, the spray paint sales operation, um, you know, this is just something that we try to do in, in cooperation with our Explorers program at the Winston-Salem Police Department. Uh, this city ordinance was enacted several years ago in trying to get some of the great uh, the spray paint out of these juveniles' hands. Uh, you're not allowed to purchase spray paint if you're under the age of 18. And so with the city ordinance, if people 
are still selling spray paint to juveniles under the age of 18, then they can be cited for that city ordinance violation. And typically what we do is we take our explorers out, they will go to different, you know, uh, Walmart, um, a lot of the auto shops like Advance Auto or O'Reilly's, and they'll try and buy spray paint. And uh, if the the person at the store actually sells them the spray paint. We do provide them a citation for the violation of that city ordinance uh, with a mandatory court appearance. But as long as they come to court and they understand that they were not supposed to sell that graffiti or that spray paint to the juvenile, and they've taken steps to uh, mitigate that for future, uh, like posting the the city ordinance up near the the um, the cash register, then all charges are dismissed. Go to the next slide. Uh, the gang conference. This is, uh, you know, we've had it several years in Winston Salem, and uh, they love coming here, and we love having them. This year, obviously, uh, it was supposed to be in Hickory, but it got canceled due to the pandemic. Um, but we are scheduled to have it back in Winston Salem in 2021. That's normally around August of each year, so we can all look forward to that coming back to Winston Salem. Typically held at the Benton Convention Center. And that is my presentation. Does anybody have any questions for me? Members of the Council of the Committee, are there any questions for Sergeant Wally? Wally, excuse me. Mayor Pro Tem Adams. Sergeant Wally, quit. I'm sorry. Mr. Larson. Uh, the amount of gangs that we have that have been recognized in the city, uh, how do we fare? Uh, towards the other four urban areas of North Carolina that you may know of. The other four urban areas, are you talking about how do we compare as a city when yeah, compared to Greensboro, Charlotte? Raleigh, Greensboro, Durham, Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with their statistics, um, so I, I could not say exactly how we compare to them. I do know we have very close contacts with all of those agencies, and, you know, in just some places close as Greensboro, we are actually faring very well. Um, you know, especially during uh, the civil unrest we had earlier in the year, um, we were able to stay on top of that. We fared very well as a city. And a lot of the gangs that were in Greensboro actually were using that time to wreak havoc in Greensboro, in Charlotte, in Raleigh. And luckily we did not have anything nearly as, as uh, tumultuous go on here in Winston-Salem compared to those, uh, those like cities. Is it possible, Chairman Taylor, for us to have our staff to contact those other cities? Because a lot of times, you know, people approach me with, you know, we got the worst gang uh, uh, issues in Winston-Salem. And it's because, you know, I tell them, I said, I, that's not true. I said, gangs are all over the country and it's become worse than what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. But every city is, is dealing with this issue. So it would be great for the council if they can get that information to see if they'll talk to the other agencies to see where they stand as well. Thank you. No, Pro Tip Adams, I think we can get you that information. Uh, what we find is, you know, we hear about crime in the city of Winston-Salem, but we all know the truth. I mean, there is more crime in Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, and the other major urban cities in North Carolina. And I imagine gang violence will fit that same description, but we'll get that information to the council as soon as we can. Uh, Councilman Larson asked to be recognized. Yes, thank, thank you, Councilmember Taylor. Um, question about graffiti. Um, it, it, can I assume that most of the graffiti that we're looking at in this city is gang-related or not? Uh, I would say that most of it is uh, is probably 50-50 in 50 /50. this. Uh, yes, sir. And and just to elaborate on that, um, if you see graffiti that's on the train tracks, you know the 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 cars that are going by, they're big bulb, um, you know, big letters, lots of different colors, um, lots of graffiti that's actually on bridges. That that's going to be tag art. Okay. The distinction between graffiti and tag art is that. Uh, gang graffiti is all normally going to be very uh, rudimentary. It's all going to be very monochromatic, one color, um, and you know, uh, crude. 
uh, for lack of a better term. The other stuff that you see that's uh, throughout the city that's got a lot of colors and and people are actually expressing their their art in the form of tag art. So I, I would look at it. Uh, we get all the reports of graffiti that come across my desk, and uh, some of them are graf- gang graffiti 100%, but li- half of them are probably just tag art, and they don't have anything to do with gangs. Thank you. What... Um... What support do we provide the residents or people about that have had their houses tagged or graffiti put on their property? What does the city do to help mitigate that or clean it up after it occurs? Uh, after something like that occurs, they get referred to CityLink, and there is a program with the city that will go around and clean up graffiti. Uh, so if they, if it comes across my desk uh, or the gang graffiti coordinator's desk, we will look into it. We'll see if there's any video of the incident, there's any leads to follow up on, or similar graffiti in the area that we can link together where somebody was actually charged with the graffiti and they put something identical up. Therefore, we can link the two. Um, that's where we come in on it, but CityLink uh, creates uh, a file, and this group with the city can go around. If it's on uh, city property or it's viewable by the public, then they can go around and clean it up. If it's on private property, then the citizens are provided a notice um, through city inspections that they need to have it cleaned up. Well, a notice, a notice is great, but it doesn't help clean it up. Do we, do we provide um, any information about how to clean it up? Materials, cleaning materials, methodologies. If somebody tag your house, you know, you don't know much about it. Suddenly, you come out and you've got to deal with this. City's telling you to clean it up. But is is there a, is there a manual or a handout or something? A professional cleaning crews that could be brought in that helps helps residents. Um, deal with this and sort of an awkward situation for most people. Uh, I'd have to look into that to get you an answer on that, Councilmember Larson, because I'm not aware of any manual or uh, a hotline or any place that you can call other than CityLink who would be able to refer the people to um, the cleanup crew. Well, I'd like I'd like the city manager or somebody to provide some help to residents that have to confront this, either in their businesses or their homes, to know what resources might be available to help them address the problem, either themselves with cleaning up the materials that would help do that, or companies that would be able to come in and help them clean it up. We need to provide them some assistance. This is what they deal with every day. And it would be good if, if the police could do more than say, well, we photographed it, we're looking at gang connection but we'd like to have, you know, give you a manual or at least a sheet of information that says, this is useful for you to help address this problem. I think if we're not gonna help them clean it up them, ourselves, the least we can do is provide them some information that would help them do that. Obviously, we've got a crew that's doing it, so we must have some knowledge of how to mitigate these kinds of problems. Residents don't have that information. Mr. Gowdy, did you wanna weigh in? Yeah. Good evening, Chairman Taylor, members of the Public Safety Committee, as well as Council Members Elect. Um, it's, good, it's good to talk to you. Uh, the police department, as the sergeant said, they refer all of those uh, graffiti items to CityLink, which then they go to our community development department. Uh, we have an, a graffiti ordinance that uh, we will go out and contact the, contact the individuals and give them time to remove it. Uh, we don't want to have to remove it ourselves because then we'll we will end up charging the the private residents. So we try to help them with that. Uh, we also do remove it from public public signs and bridges and uh, things like that on a regular basis, and park signs as well. But I will uh, I'll talk to the, that department this evening. We have some literature that we can hand out to make it easier. Uh, maybe a short list of who the private contractors are to make it easier for uh, residents to get rid of graffiti that's on their property. Thank you. Councilman Larson, I think you bring up a great point. Around 2009 or so, when we first came on the council, we had this happen to a lot of private residences. And in fact, the graffiti ordinance was the first ordinance that I passed with the help of the council because it was a complete problem in our in our community. So we've made some headway, but we still have some work to do. I think that's an excellent idea. And I think that's something we can, we can possibly get done. Uh, Councilman McIntosh. One group that um, gets paid to do that locally is the is Bud Services as part of the as part of the bid group. Um, that is paid for by additional tax revenues that are that are charged to downtown businesses. So somebody who lives in Sherwood Forest doesn't pay for for um, graffiti removal in downtown. Um, they do it on a very regular basis. So I would imagine that that might be a good contact to work with in order to put together. Uh, 
a materials list or a methodology list. Um, one of my frustrations with graffiti is when a railroad property gets tagged. <laughs> it seems to take forever. As we all know, the railroad is very difficult to deal with, and that's just an ongoing source of frustration from, uh, from people. And, and as the gang unit guys know, I mean, one of the reasons you want to get rid of gang graffiti quick is that if it's not up and people don't get to see it, then it's not doing the gang any good. They want to see that out there and staying up and to be recognized. And if it can be dealt with quickly, like it is downtown, you get less of it because people know it's just not going to stick around. So the railroad company is doing none of us any favors by allowing that stuff to stay up. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Excellent points. Uh, Councilwoman Parman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So over the past few months, I heard everything that you said. Um, this is, I guess, for information purposes, not necessarily a question, but a comment, that we have the JCPC here in Forsyth County. And over the past few months, we have been speaking to um, Mr. Lasseter, who's the Deputy Secretary at the North Carolina DP, uh, DPS, who works with um, our Attorney General, Mr. Josh Stein, and Rich Smith, who's our Area Consultant with the Juvenile Justice for the North Carolina DPCS, and locally, Stark, uh, Stan Clarkson who's also the chief court counselor for the Safe County Juvenile Court. And I understand with the gangs that because we have 30 to 35, one of the things that we've learned over the course of the past few months was that there are resources that are available from the state level. If we have not tapped into that and utilized that for our gangs and the activity here in Winston-Salem, and as um, for the local part with the Forsyth County piece with Mr. Stan Clarkson, they're getting ready to put out an RFP because they were awarded some monetary funds that'll be dispersed out at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So if the police department or the gang task unit was not aware of that, that there is optional resources to help with the intervention and prevention piece, not just, you know, what we as a city give them, but there's also state funding. So I, you know, encourage them to get in touch with those partners as well to see how they can better help us. And as it relates to the amount of gangs that we have in Winston-Salem, it was brought to us at the same meetings that we are not as high with our gang activity and gang members as they are over in the Charlotte and Greensboro and Durham area. So we do have the data for that. They can be shared with the other council members. Thank you for bringing it to my attention, uh, Councilwoman Palmer. We'll, we'll certainly look into it. We'll reach out to Josh Don's office and, and see if we can't get some funding com from coming from the state to address those uh, issues that we're facing. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard uh, on this particular item? Or do you have any questions or concerns for Sergeant Wally at this time? Seeing nothing further, uh, we'll thank Sergeant Wally for the presentation. It's very informational, and uh, we'll gather some information and use your expertise in order to truly make a difference when it comes to gang violence in the city. So thanks for your service, Sergeant Wally, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And members of the council, in my haste, um, I, I did forget to read the Safer at Home of order. So I'm going to take a moment and do that before we go to item two. Uh, so this is safer at home order. All committee members are participating virtually. Uh, it's pretty obvious by now. But for virtual meetings, comm committee members will be muted until asked to be heard. When there is a vote, it'll be necessary to take a roll call vote. A committee member will be recognized and will raise their hand and state their vote. Uh, with that being said, we'll move to item G2. If our clerk would call the item, please. Item G2, information on Winston Salem Police Department's receiving the Distinguished Triac Award. All right, so uh, I see uh, Chief Thompson has chimed in. Uh, Chief Thompson, we'll go directly to you. Uh, congratulations on this award, and you have the floor for the explanation. Thank you, Chair Taylor, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, um, members of council and council elect. Um, I just wanted to inform you that the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, or CALEA, awarded the Winston-Salem Police Department the Distinguished Triarch Award. 
The CALEA Triarch Award is given to agencies with concurrent CALEA accreditations for their law enforcement, public safety communications, and public safety training academies. The Winston-Salem Police Department is the first law enforcement agency in the state of North Carolina to receive the Triarch. We are also the 18th law enforcement agency in the United States and only the 24th law enforcement agency in the world to receive this award. Um, I am extremely proud of our agency, our um, officers, civilian employees, and most importantly, the support that we receive from the city and city government. Um, it is really um, an honor for us to receive this level of accreditation, um, and we will continue to strive to uh, look for uh, the best practices when it comes to law enforcement uh, and policing policies and procedures. In addition to the Triarch, the Winston-Salem Police Department also received the Kalia Meritorious Award, and that award is given to any law enforcement agency that has successfully been um, accredited for 15 consecutive years. So again, the Winston-Salem Police Department um, is extremely proud to, to be able to um, have earned this level of accreditation and be recognized in this manner in our law enforcement policies and practices. Thank you, Chief. Congratulations. You spoke the hand claps. Um, every time that I speak at a uh, graduation or some police related event, I say the same thing about the fire department. And I, I got to be honest, but I, I say that we have the best police department in the United States of America. And people think I'm blowing smoke, but there is factual evidence to, 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 to many of my claims. So thank you for your service to our community. And I'll say it again. We have the best police department in America and your leadership speak volumes to how we're able to make that happen. So thanks for everything you do to help our city to be a better place to live, work and relax. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to be heard regarding this item? Seeing no one, this may be a, an extremely short meeting. Uh, members of the council committee, council members elect, is there any further business that should be considered for the good of the order? I see a bunch of no's, so seeing nothing further, we'll consider this meeting to be adjourned. Thank you, and we hope everybody has a blessed night and a blessed week. Thank you. Right